Tonight's shiur is called Wisdom, Strength, Wealth, and the Small Jug of Pure Hanukkah Olive Oil. What is the connection between wisdom, strength, wealth, and the pure jug of olive oil? We will see tonight. The Gemara asks, My Hanukkah, what is the miracle of Hanukkah? The Tanu Rabbanan that our sages taught us that when the um, king, the the kings of the um, tribe of Hashmonaim, for which were from the priestly group of people, came into the temple to rededicate the temple, they were looking for olive oil to light. The menorah, the menorah, we have an obligation in the temple times when the temple existed to light the menorah, the candelabra, every single day. And therefore they cleaned out the temple. The Greeks came and defiled the temple. And <clears throat> when the Jewish people were victorious in, in their battle, they came to rededicate the temple. They cleansed it all and they, they sought to light the candelabra, but they couldn't find any oil because the Greeks tampered with all of the oils. They touched, the, they defiled all of the oils. The question is, until they found, a miracle happened, Tosfot writes, one of the commentary writes there, that there was a jug of oil, a pure jug of oil with the seal of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, that was buried somewhere, and, they, and that's what they found. And they used that. And miraculously, it lasted for eight days. Instead of one day, it lasted for eight days. Without going to all of the details um, about the miracle of Hanukkah, <clears throat> of, the, of the oil, and, uh, and it was necessary to wait for seven days until new oil can be produced, and comes back in the traveling time altogether. So they had one jug of oil. But anyway, be it as it may, the miracle of Hanukkah is for eight days. And we light a candelabra with eight candles, and every day we increase a candle. The sages, wants to know, the sages want to know exactly what is the nature of this miracle of Hanukkah, that it was established on oil. Why wasn't the miracle on the victory? If there was no victory, the battle which the few fought the many, the weak fought the mighty, mighty army. Anybody who knows a little bit of history knows that at that time, the Greeks ruled the world. At that time, there were two kingdoms. The Greek empire was divided into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And they basically ruled everywhere. Very powerful. And the few went and did battle courageously against the many and the mighty. That is a huge miracle, yet the miracle is not established upon the military victory, rather on the oil. The question is, usually when people do battle, they take spoils of war. Whereas here we found that the Greeks had no intention of disturbing the artifacts and the articles in the temple. The temple had beautiful artifacts, they had beautiful menorah. We know that in the Greek, in the, in the arch in, the, uh, in Rome, you see a, uh, uh, the victory arch there whatever it is that they call it, you see their depictions of, of them carrying the spoils of the temple, of the first temple, of the second temple. So they took the spoils, it was very beautiful things there, a golden candelabra, and beautiful silver vessels, and golden vessels, they didn't touch it, the, the candelabra was there. They just defiled the oil. They weren't interested in battle per se against the Jewish body. They weren't interested in taking spoils of war and pillaging Israel. What they were interested in was a spiritual battle, to defile the oil. And what is the symbol of this oil, we will soon see. The Medrash, there's an interesting Medrash in Bamidbar, Medrash Rabbah. It's a very interesting Medrash. The Medrash says that three gifts were created in the world, and anyone who merits any one of them takes all the delight in the world. What are these three gifts? So the Midrash says 
The first gift is wisdom. The second gift is strength. The third gift is wealth. Now I'm going to explain them backwards. The third gift is wealth. It is that which is most external to us. It is an appendix. Wealth is not something that is intrinsically mine. It is something that is added to me. It's not a part of who I am. It's not a part of me. It's something external that becomes a part of my life externally. And something that is easily recognized, a person's opulence and wealth, is recognized by his externals, by his, by his dress, by the house, by the luxuries that they may have, but not intrinsically. You can't look at a person's eyes and see whether the person is intrinsically wealthy, because wealth is not a blessing that is associated with one's innards, with one's soul, with one's talents. There are many not talented people that are very wealthy, and there are many people who are talented are not wealthy. Many clever people are not wealthy, and many not so clever people are wealthy. It is an appendix. It is no expression of who we really are. The second gift that the Midrash says is that of strength. I would like to, if I dare possibly extend the Midrash and say it's not just strength. Strength is something that is more associated with myself. You can't look at a person and know whether he's strong or not. Sometimes people who look very... Um, small and uh, you know very flimsy are in fact very very strong but you can tell you can tell a person's strength when they show it and if I dare say that this perhaps a midrash here is speaking not just about strength per se but any other talent that God blesses us with we have different strengths not just physical strength but different strengths and talents that God blesses us with it's a blessing But of course, might and, and, and strength, power, that's a, that's a very, very great thing to have. In fact, the, uh, our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were very, very strong. So there is something of strength within itself, not just only strength of spirit and courage. But physical strength is somehow associated with, with an inner strength, a, an inner spiritual strength. So that refers to the, another blessing. That's another blessing that God gave us. And if you have that, you're, you're a wealthy man, so to speak. You're an enriched person. You have talents. And these talents are a very good thing. So the first one is wealth. That's an appendix. It's a very wonderful blessing to have. The second blessing is that of strength or strength that we may have. And the third blessing is wisdom. Wisdom is to be wise, to understand something, to understand the depth of something. And that is the most, the greatest gift. And that is the gift that is most intrinsically and most intrinsically associated with self and is the most um, intimate with us. You can't look at a person and see whether he is wise or not. It is that which is most deeply associated with self. A person thinks his thoughts are hidden, much more hidden than a person's emotions. When a person is, has emotions, you can see it in his face, whether the person is sad or upset. Many times you look at a person, you know, what's wrong? Or, or, uh, or why are you happy? Why are you so happy? What, what's, uh, what, what's going on in your life? But wisdom is something that is in one's mind, that is something that is the most intimate. So strength is less intimate. Wealth is less intimate. But wisdom is the most intimate. And the Madras says, anybody who has any one of these three is a very enriched person. Why is that? Because God gives every single one of us gifts. And it is up to us to recognize and use those gifts for good. To utilize those gifts to come close to Hashem, not God forbid the opposite. Everything in this world is created within the vacuum of equilibrium. <clears throat> and just as everything can be used for good, things can be used for bad. Things can be used for self-centered, for ego, to, 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 the, the, to, uh, 
to serve one's own ego, to be self-serving. So one can use one's wealth to serve one's own desires, what one wants, and to feed one's ego, that e- to even err and think that we are deserving of wealth. What do you mean? And it's mine and I earned it and I don't need to share with anybody else. Whereas wealth was created the exact opposite, to glorify God and to use the material wealth. Again, each one of the three, at least in my opinion, is a symbol of something that is broader, not just wealth, but any external blessing that God gives us is there to be able to be tapped into and to utilize for to come closer to Hashem. So for example, let's say a person is not a scholar, but the Almighty blessed him with wealth or any gift that comes his way, that is an opportunity, that is a blessing that God is giving that individual to be able to glorify God's name in the world, either to increase Torah study in the world, to increase yeshivot, to take care of the poor, the needy, etc. And by doing so, one unifies the world. We know that one of the mitzvot of Purim is to give mishloach manot ish or to give gifts, food parcels one to another in order to be able to increase Jewish harmony and Jewish unity. When you give gifts to each other, it increases harmony. So God blessed you with something, and you share it with others, you unify God's glory, especially when you attribute that success or that blessing to godliness. And if you're able to overcome your own ego and understand that this is simply a blessing of God and you are custodian of that blessing, then you have done well, and you have been wise to, re- to remove the facade of these talents that we attribute to, to ourselves and use as a tool for our own ego and to, to be self-serving. And God forbid if the converse is true. And the converse is, is possibly true. And we know that to be the case, that people use it to be self-serving and defeat the whole purpose of unifying God and recognize the unity of God in everything in this world, including the gifts that we were given. And there is no doubt that invariably and in varying degrees as individuals and as a nation, we sometimes have abused the luxury, the wealth, the tranquility, the blessings and the talents that God enriched the Jewish people either as individuals or as a nation, especially in the land of Israel, when the Jewish people were living in harmony in the land of Israel under the kingdom of God, the kingship and rulership of King David, King Shaul, King David, and they had the temple, and there were divine revelations, and there was tranquility and peace and wealth when we followed the will of God. But how easily we use these very items to become corrupt. As it says, Vaishman Yishurun Vaivat. And the Jewish people waxed fat, so to speak, from the fat of the land and rebelled against God. You became, expanded yourself, expanded your, your ego, expanded your wills and your desire and that which serves the self, as opposed to using it for the Almighty. So since in our times or times that we abuse these gifts, these three gifts, came upon us nations that exerted their, these three gifts upon the Jewish people, the influence of these three gifts upon the Jewish people. Let's see how. There were three nations that came upon the Jewish people. And subjugated or defiled one of those aspects of those three gifts. One of them was Babel, the Babylonians. The Babylonians were known to be the most mighty of nation in the world at that time. Fierce, powerful and mighty nation. That corresponds to strength or talents. Another nation that ruled over the Jewish people, was Padas Umadai. You remember the miracle of Hanukkah? Purim. Purim, uh, Purim, I beg your pardon. They were very opulent, very wealthy. 
King Ahasuerus made a feast for a lengthy period of time with all good and wines and beautiful vessels and he showed off his wealth. The palace was decorated with such opulence. So that was another nation that came and subjugated the Jewish people. They came from a different angle. They came of that of wealth. And it is very easy when we are sub subjugated by a, by a nation that is very powerful and very mighty to um, express feelings of weakness and self-doubt. Or when a wealthy nation subjugates us to seek to um, emulate the wealth, the opulence, He's got this car, I want this car. He's got this type of house, I want this type of house. He's got this, I want that. Everybody's got this. We live beyond our means. We don't, definitely don't need as much as what we have. No, it's definitely not. And what we buy, what we procure for ourselves. And the luxury, luxuries and the leisures that we have for ourselves. But it is very easy when we live in an environment or a nation of wealth or opulence or any particular type of talent to try to seek to emulate and to forget the core values and morals of our traditions and to put them aside, God forbid. So came this nation to correct the fact that we abused our opulence when we were wealthy, when we had tranquility in our land and we did not utilize it for the service of God, as Maimonides writes, that one of the conditions when Mashiach will come is that will be all of the good of the, of the world will be like dust of the earth, will be found like dust of the earth. Why? In order to give us the opportunity to delve into knowing God. When a person is poor, sickly, when a person is continually busy chasing after um, his livelihood, he doesn't have the tranquility and peace of mind to be able to pursue spiritual pursuits. It's very hard. Maimonides writes that at the end of days we will merit such opulence and such tranquility that that will afford us the opportunity to study and to delve and to understand spirituality. To prepare ourselves for the ultimate world to come. And then there was another nation that subjugated the Jewish people. Which nation were they? The Greeks. In the miracle of Hanukkah. The Greeks had no problem with the Jewish people. Had no problem with the culture of the Jewish people. You can have as much culture as you want. You can eat as much donut as you want. As much uh, cheesecakes on Shavuot as you want. You can eat as much hamim as you want on Shabbat. But to say that there is something beyond the natural and the physical. That we do not accept. There was a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. They could not accept the fact that there is a concept of God that is beyond. That there is metaphysical. They also had gods. But their gods were all a, a, um, a transference of man's own ego and lust and desires and, and, and um, power and wealth. Each of their gods represented a different human weakness. And if each of their gods has a human weakness, then how much more so we have that weakness and we are permitted to behave in this particular weakness. In other words, their gods were a reflection of their own weaknesses. Or their own desires or their own passions, just in a, in a greater way. As we know in Greek mythology. But the concept of metaphysical, beyond the spiritual, that there is something holy, there is something, concept of pure and impure, pure oil and impure oil. There is culture, there is wisdom, there is art, there is music. There is philosophy, and we know the Greeks were great philosophers. But to ascribe wisdom to something that is beyond the human understanding, something that is beyond the self, that they couldn't accept. And thus there was a, a turmoil between them and their, 
and, and the, the, the inhabitants of the land of Israel that was ruled by the Greeks. And they sought to destroy this, the religion, the faith of the Jewish people, not the body of the Jewish people. And therefore when they came into the sanctuary, they didn't take the spoils. They didn't take the menorah. They didn't take anything of the temple. They simply came to defile that which the Jewish people, according to their faith, was pure, was holy. They did not believe in the concept of pure and holy, that this oil has any more sanctity than this oil, and this oil has any more purity than this oil. And that there is something that is beyond the body and beyond the mind, beyond the realm of nature. This they could not accept. And therefore, the battle against the Jewish people was, as it says in the, the um, prayer that we say on Hanukkah, Torah to make them forget your Torah. It doesn't say to make them forget Torah. For Torah, there's great wisdom in the Torah. And they acknowledge that. The Talmud is full of wisdom. The, ta- the Talmud is full of psychology. Anybody who studies the Talmud sees unbelievable psychology and advice for life. Besides teachings of the law, great wisdom, great structure to society and how humans should engage and behave with each other. They appreciated that because they appreciated wisdom, they appreciated knowledge, but a different type of wisdom, a different type of knowledge, one that serves, serves the self, not one that allows us to go beyond the self. And this is the difference between the wisdom and the culture, the Greek philosophy, and the wisdom of the culture of Torah. And this is why it says, Lashkiham Torah their battle was to make the Jewish people forget your Torah, God's Torah. To say that there is a wisdom, a tradition that we have received, culture, ideas, philosophies, beautiful. They had their own. And they can accept others having their own as well. I mean, they had no problem having many different gods and one didn't contradict the other. So one more God, what, what big deal is there? One more philosophy, one more idea, one more tradition, no problem. But Torah Techa, your Torah, that there is something divine that they couldn't accept. Power, might, wealth, wisdom that are all interconnected and interlocked one with the other that is associated with the self, they had an appreciation for. And what they came is to defile Jewish wisdom. So what is Jewish wisdom? What is Jewish wisdom? We know that when God created the world, He revealed and expressed Himself in ten emanations, in ten different ways. They are called the Eses Sfirot, the Ten Sfirot, the Ten Emanations beginning with three intellectual, and the, re- the six emotional, and Malchut, and God's divine kingship. The first one, and the most powerful one, and the one where everything emanates from it, is Chokhmah, is wisdom, God's wisdom. Therefore, we understand that when God created and put into place a system of descent by which godliness would descend from level to level and become concealed and further concealed and further concealed until it trickles down to this world and creates a physical world by which on the one hand is created by God, yet on the other hand godliness is so hidden that we feel a, a, a separate entity. So that there is an existence of world, and but the true existence and the, the energy behind all existence, which is godliness, is to such a degree, hidden to such a degree, that it affords us free choice to do the will of God. The beginning of all of that, as we learned a, li- a little bit with the four worlds, the four worlds, the first world was the world of Atsilut, the world of emanation. And in that world, the highest of the ten spheres, the highest of the ten sphirot, of the ten emanations, is that of Chokhmah, of wisdom. Therefore, it stands to reason, even though God is unlimited, and where, where, where there is unlimitedness, it doesn't matter whether there's a billion or one, it's just as near or far to infinity. But nonetheless, the starting point 
of, of, of some revelation of spirituality and, physical, and, and the source of all worlds is Chokhmah, the divine wisdom. And therefore, if we were to sort of use the, the example of near and far, as far as spiritual is concerned, there's no near and far as far as place is concerned. But near and far, as far as spiritual is concerned, that first emanation or revelation of godliness is one that is, so to speak, the, if you could use that word, and we'll borrow that word, closest to the infinite one, the ends of the infinite one. Therefore, the closest you are to the concept of Jewish wisdom, the closer you are to the concept of Jewish wisdom, the closer you are to the infinite one, so to speak, or to spirituality. The further away you are from wisdom, what Jewish wisdom symbolizes, which we will soon see, so to speak, the further you are from the concept of spirituality or ensof or the infinite one. Conversely, the further you are from spirituality, from godliness, the further you are from true Jewish wisdom. The closer you are to spirituality, the closer you are to Jewish wisdom. What is Jewish wisdom? Chokhmah, as we mentioned on previous occasions, is a composite of two things. Koah ma, the ability to recognize the truth, the ability to recognize the divine, the ability to overcome the facade, and know without a shadow of a doubt that everything comes from God and God is the essence of all existence. And existence is not dependent upon how I perceive things. Because the way I perceive things and the way a cow perceives things, the way the cow looks at the grass and how I look at the grass or the world or the sky is two different ways. The way a prophet looks at the world and at the sky and the way I look at the world and the sky, two different ways. The way Moshe Rabbeinu looks at the world and the sky is different than other prophets. The way an angel looks at the sky and at the world and existence as large is different. We know that the world is made up of electromagnetic fields. Everything is electromagnetic. Yet when we look at a table, we see a table. We don't see the atoms moving. We don't see the energy moving. But we know that there is something beyond the table. But the way I see things, because my vision is limited, I see the table the way a physical table is. But if I had the eyes to see, I would be able to see the atom or the electromagnetic energy that exists within the table, within this world at large. So scientifically, I understand that there are things beyond the table. There's a concept of energy, atoms, energy, whatever we want to call it. This is true as well of spirituality. And therefore, the word chokhmah is a composite of ma the ability to nullify ourselves. As Moshe and Aharon said, Nahnu makit alenu. Alenu. What are we that you come and, and dispute us? Not, it's not us. Lo alenu tilunachem. Tilunotachem. Your complaints are not against us. Your complaints are against Hashem. We're nothing. We're just, me- we're just messengers. We're just the tools of God. We're absolutely nothing. The more you recognize this, the more you are able to understand to have what Jewish wisdom is, and that is the pervasive um, existence, power of God, and that He is all and, 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 and everything is included within Him. And that is what wisdom is all about. The ability to see beyond, to feel beyond. And the more we nullify ourselves, the less ego that we have, the, more, the less sense of self that we have, the more we're able to gauge this, understand this wisdom, and thus spirituality. The less, the less. The more ego that we have, the more sense of self, the less spiritual you're able to feel, and spiritually sensitive you're able to be, and godly, and divine, and holy. So, 
in a nutshell, this is what Jewish wisdom is all about. The ability to go beyond oneself, go beyond that which is self-serving, to go beyond using our wisdom to understand what I want and how I should go about getting it. But go beyond myself and reach a core. Like God says to Abraham, Lech lecha. Why the double expression? Go, you shall surely go. To the land where I will show you. Go, you shall surely go. Is no accident. Lech lecha, Rashi says, for yourself. In other words, literally means for your own benefit. But on a deeper level means lech lecha, go within yourself, to yourself, to your inner core, to the source of who you really are. To do that, you have to nullify the ego, you have to nullify the self. And that is what Jewish wisdom is all about. Oil is the symbol of Torah wisdom. It's light, it's willingness, the, the, the flickering of the flame, You're almost wanting to leave the, 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 the candle, is a symbol of that. The desire to go beyond itself. If a fire will leave at the wick, there will be no more fire. Yet the nature of fire is to continually flicker upwards. And you can see, you can see the fire that sometimes flies and, 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 and leaves the wick. And there's a bit of a flame there that just went, uh, where did it go? It disappeared almost. It left the rest of the flame. You see this? The nature of the flame is to flicker and go beyond itself. That's what Jewish wisdom is all about. And that's the Torah. It gives us the insight to go beyond ourselves, to go to our core, to recognize the core of ourselves and the core of the whole world, which is godliness. Go beyond the facade of the material, the natural. And this is symbolized by the oil, by the pure olive oil. And the pure olive oil, it says, katit lama or, one of, the, one of the conditions that was necessary to be used as olive oil in the temple had to be crushed. And the first drop that comes in, the most purest, pure extra virgin olive oil, katit lama or, has to be crushed. When it's crushed, then it's lama or, then it can be used for the, for the candelabra. If it's blended, With sediments, can't be used. Katit means it's crushed. What does it mean crushed? When we crush our ego. When you crush your ego, when you crush the body, so to speak, you reveal the soul. You reveal the oil. You reveal that which is inside. That which the body belies or hides. The olive. You look at the olive. Look, nice olive. You squeeze it, you get the oil. Olive oil is much more expensive than an olive. It's much more precious than olive. It has much, many functions, including medicinal functions, giving warmth and light. It has to be crushed. Why is that? Because the symbol of what olive oil is, is wisdom. Spiritual wisdom. To get to spiritual wisdom, you have to crush the ego. You have to crush the body, so to speak. You have to put it aside. You have to squeeze it, manipulate a little bit to take what's inside. The lech lecha, the go to yourself, to your core, is putting aside the body, the desire, the body. Ramban, Ramban, Nachmanides writes that the more materially attached we are, the less automatically spiritually attached we are. The less physically attached we are, the more we're able to become spiritually attached. One goes hand in hand. They are mutually exclusive. Material and spiritual mutually, mutually exclusive. You cannot be a glutton and feel spirituality. It doesn't go hand in hand. They used to say a beautiful story about a great scholar who was on his deathbed and All of a sudden, he says that I regret all of his life, all of his adult life, he would sleep on a bench in the synagogue. 
wouldn't sleep in a comfortable bed with latex and a layer of bamboo and uh, pocket springs <laughs> with thermal covering and five zone springs. <laughs> None of that. He slept on a bench. I slept on a bench a few times. Very uncomfortable. You can't sleep on a bench. A few times that I was stranded or you know, very tired in the synagogues or wherever I was studying or when I was in Russia, for example, between city to city. Slept on a bench. It wasn't very comfortable at all. You don't get a good night's sleep on a bench, I can tell you that much. Have you ever slept on a bench? Aircraft. Slept on a bench? Not comfortable at all. Even the airports don't have benches like the good old benches. They've got decent seats and they're nicely angled and you can sit there and the air conditioning. Menashe says that the economy seats, that's to him as a bench. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, not comfortable. All of a sudden the scholar says, all of a sudden the scholar says, I regret sleeping on a bench. In other words, what he did his whole life was he placed little importance on the comforts and the leisures of life. That's, that's, a, that's a model character. That's a model spiritual being. Not everybody can do that. I would definitely not get a good night's sleep and be in a good mood the next day if I had to sleep on a bench every day and, and be able to study with great intensity and pray with great intensity. You know, not, wouldn't be able to do it. And all of a sudden he says, I regret it. And they asked him, but Why? How can you regret something that was just was a symbol of depriving yourself of the material comforts and leisures? And he said, ah, because this weakened my body. And maybe if I would have slept on a bed, my body would be a bit stronger and I'll be able to live another day or two. And if I'm able to live another day or two, I'll be able to put on tefillin for another day or two. And oh, the quality of putting on tefillin for another day or two, nothing in the world can ever measure and then he passed away. And his disciples and the students standing around, they said, ah, to be able to have such an appreciation for a mitzvah, you've got to sleep on a bench for 70 years. <laughs> a regular person doesn't have such an appreciation for a mitzvah. A regular person wants to live another day, to live another day. To be with his family, to have another meal, to enjoy the world, to be, to be so, we're so attached to the physical world, we don't want to leave it. Few don't want to leave the physical world because it's an opportunity. Another day gives us another opportunity for a mitzvah, for tshuva, for repentance, to come close to Hashem. And of course, this is the case of argument against euthanasia, where people argue the quality of life. How, do, how can you define the quality of life? Where as long as the neshama is in the body, things can be achieved. And I know for a fact that when people were unconscious, later on they told me when they came out of their coma or consciousness, they were aware that I was saying prayers or someone said prayers by their bedside. And I can tell you many stories, but now is not the time. So things go on, but they're aware, they know. And things are achieved, even in a, in a, in a state where people, the regular guy doesn't appreciate what quality of life did the person have sitting there in bed in the hospital for one day, two days, one month, two months, three months, six months, etc. So the Greeks wanted to defile the oil, the wisdom of Judaism. And this was the battle. And let me tell you something. They were very convincing because they were great philosophers they worshipped beauty. Who doesn't appreciate beauty? Who doesn't like beauty? If I gave you an opportunity, here's a beautiful, uh, give me a car, Lexus, Porsche, and here you have an old, uh, I don't know, Falcon. Do they have Falcons anymore? Who? Susita. Susita. You have the old Israeli, uh, um, what's that famous car in Israel that everybody drives the beaten ones? The Subaru. The Subarus, you know, everyone in Israel has got there. Everyone starts their career in driving in Israel on an old beaten Subaru that they paid 5,000 shekel for. If I gave you the opportunity, a beautiful, nice Mercedes or a, 
beaten Subaru, you'd take it any day. Of course you would. Who doesn't appreciate a beautiful tree, beautiful house, beautiful chair, beautiful carpet? No, give me the ugliest carpet that you have. Same price. No, give me the ugliest. No one says that. They were very convincing, the Greeks, into music, into art, into poetry. Beautiful architecture. I love architecture. It's nice. I like, I, it interests me whenever I go and I, I'm, I'm always looking at buildings. I love architecture. It interests me. It's a beautiful thing to look at. The design, the thought that went into it, the, 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 the art that went into it. It's a beautiful thing. They were very convincing. The philosophy was engaging. It was interesting. As a rule of thumb, the Jewish people rarely assimilated, assimilated in a nation where they were beneath their dignity. When a nation was seemingly on par with them intellectually and emotionally, there was assimilation. When the Jewish people lived by the, in Persia, in the old Persians, or the Babylonians, they were uncouth people. They weren't, they weren't sanitary, they weren't clean, their, their eating habits, were, the Talmud says, were, were, not, were not refined at all. There was, there was no, there was no uh, what do you call it? There, there was no assimilation there. There was great assimilation in the time of the Greeks. They accepted them, they taught them art, they taught them culture, philosophy, beauty, worship of the body. Physique, Olympic, sports, beautiful uh, uh, physique. Oh, it's convincing. They contaminate the oil, the pure oil. So that was appealing to the people. A person will, be cons- will consider going out with a, uh, engaging with, with, with a banker, with a lawyer, with a doctor, rather than with some, uh, I don't know what, a grave digger. So whenever the people were on a higher level in society, the danger of assimilation for the Jewish people was greater. And they penetrated. They penetrated the ranks of the Jewish people, especially amongst the young. Thus, when they won the battle... They fought a spiritual battle. The first thing they sought to do was to light the menorah, the candelabra. But they didn't want to, even the halakha permits, to light with oil that did not have the seal of the Kohen. They did not want to. Halakha permitted that they could. They did not want to. And the reason is, is because they, it, was, it was a battle of the spirit. It was a battle of pure and impure. They wanted to make a point. So they didn't just pick up any oil. They looked and looked and searched until they find one jar of of olive oil. Because the symbolism here was purity. Something that is unadulterated. A part of us that can never be touched, can never be defiled. That was a symbolism. And who were they? They were the Hashmonaim, family of Kohanim. And we know that the Kohen, they were the descendants of Aharon. Aharon was the brother of Moshe Rabbeinu that said, Nahnu ma, what are we? Still the ego was able to achieve spiritual wisdom. As opposed to the philosophy of the Greeks that was all about them and ego. Aristotle said, proclaimed that anything that he was unable to understand was by definition untrue. Or in my words, did not exist. Untrue means did not exist. If Aristotle says, said about himself, if I don't understand it, doesn't exist, not true, can't be true. If I understand it, it's true. Where Jewish wisdom is the recognition of something beyond me, something unlimited, for everything of me is limited, is finite. And that is Jewish wisdom. And that was the battle of Hanukkah. And that's why they looked for the pure olive oil with the seal of the Kohen. To show that there's a part of us that can never be adulterated, can never be defiled. Every single Jew is a part of him that can never be defiled. Can't be touched. 
It is sealed. Nothing can touch it. Nothing can defile it. And that's what we have to search. They, they made a point of searching for it because we have to search for it within ourselves. There's an interesting verse. And we will conclude with that. In the Bereshit, in the beginning, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. The ha-aretz atay tov avo v'choshech ha-penet ahon. The world was, was without form and confounded. V'choshech ha-penet ahon. And there was darkness upon the face of the depth. There was darkness. What is this darkness? The sages say, this was a symbolism of the darkness or the, of the lack of spiritual wisdom, the lack of spiritual clarity and vision, the lack of understanding that everything comes from God, things that are hidden. No proper spiritual vision. And that, says the sages, is, was the era of the Greeks, more so than other nations that, that ruled with either might or with wealth, that is something that is not intrinsically corrupt. That is something that is a bit more external, can more easily be removed from us and rectified. But when you try and corrupt wisdom itself, that is darkness. That is the greatest darkness. And what is interesting is, what did the Greeks try to do to the Jewish people? Lashkiham Toratecha. To make the Jewish people forget, to forget God's Torah, God's wisdom, the godly dimension of Torah, the godly dimension of our ethics and our morals. We don't do it because it's right or because I think that it's right because tomorrow I'll change my mind and I'll say, no, this is right. Or that's right. Or this union is okay. Or that union is okay. Or euthanasia is okay. Or this age or that age. That's okay. That's not okay. Tomorrow this age that age. This condition or that condition. If it's divine, you cannot touch it. It's pure. To make them forget your Torah, shachah, in Hebrew, shachah, the root of the word, to forget, shin, chaf, and het, is the exact same letters as hoshech, darkness. When you forget the godly dimension of the world, the godly sparks that exist within everything, then you are in darkness. Then you are in spiritual darkness. And that is why the oil represents Torah. The wisdom of God is Torah. And we need to all study Torah and to increase our knowledge of Torah because it's God's Torah. It's not just a pursuit of a topic or a subject that is interesting and fascinating, but it is something sublime and unlimited. And when we study Torah, we're able to reveal that crucible of oil, of pure oil, that exists within every single one of us, that cannot be tampered, cannot be touched. Nobody can defile it. That exists very, very deep, deep, deep within us, like the olive oil that was hidden sim symbolically, not only actually, but symbolically was hidden in the temple and had the seal of the Kohen Gadol, something that is sealed within us and lays deep buried within us, can be revealed and can be revealed through the study of Torah. And when we reveal, when we study Torah, we remove the forgetfulness of godliness and we remove shachach, the letter shachach, we remove darkness of the world. And what do we introduce? Redemption. What does it say right after it says it was darkness? The Spirit of God hovers over the face of the water. And the Midrash says, Mashiach. This is the Spirit of Redemption. How do we get redemption? Through Torah study. Through guarding that crucible of oil, that pure, unadulterated oil that, that, that exists within us that has the seal of, so to speak, of the Kohen, of the concept of nullification and nulling the, nullifying the ego, that is how we can reach. That we can dispel the darkness 
and heralded in redemption. Amen. Stop here. Anybody has any questions?